Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Garden Hour, brought to you by SDSU Extension every week at this hour. I'm Rhoda Burrows, SDSU Extension Horticulturist, and I will be your host this evening. Tonight's panelists will include Christine Lang, Consumer Horticulture Extension Specialist. And Christine, what will you be visiting with us about tonight? Well, I'm going to share some insights based on an inquiry I received yesterday, and I'll also be talking about a perennial we should be dividing this time of year. We look forward to it. Amanda uh, Bachman is our pesticide education and urban entomology field specialist. Boy, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Amanda, what kind of creaky crawlies are you going to be visiting with us about tonight? Well, I'm um, keeping with my theme of an insect to watch out for in the garden, uh, the insect that I'm getting the most questions about, and then also just a cool insect that has come in over the week. So you can start placing your bets now as to which insect falls into which category. <laughs> and John Ball, our SDSU Extension Forester and South Dakota State Forest Health Specialist. Uh, John, what's going on this week? Well, I'm going to talk about, again, how advanced we are in a season. We're still ahead with all this hot weather. So tonight I'm talking about where emerald ash borer is, not in terms of, of location, but development in the tree. And then I'm going to talk about fall webworm, because you know what? It, we're just about there. So that'll be tonight. All right. We're ready for, for a good session tonight. And I will be talking about some common tomato problems, uh, lots of questions about ripening and, and not setting fruit uh, on, on tomatoes and, and cucurbits and peppers. And, and so again, with our hot weather. Um, before I begin though, let me remind you to use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen to ask questions at any point during the show. If we don't catch them right away while we're talking, we'll come back to them at the end of the show. So uh, with that, I will go ahead and get us started. So tomatoes, are you having problems that look like this? Christine uh, sent me this picture earlier today, and I've been seeing some similar looking blossoms, sad looking blossoms on my own tomatoes here in Rapid. Uh, the ideal tomato temperature is actually only from 68 degrees to 79 degrees. So basically 70 to 80 degrees. A lot of people think, oh, it's 90 degrees. Those tomatoes are doing well. Well, actually, they start to suffer at 95 degrees. We can get the pollen is, is damaged and, and doesn't function like it should. Once you get up to 104, and a lot of us saw that in the last few weeks, uh, the ovio itself can be damaged in addition to the pollen. So this was probably... Uh, in, in response to some of these really high temperatures that we've been seeing. As soon as it cools down, that will help. The other time that we see a lot of damage due to temperature is if the night temperatures stay warmer. So if they stay above 70, they're less able to offset damage of those really high temperatures during the day. So we like to see it dropping down at night that, that can help some. If it stays up 75 or 80 degrees, that's, that's really uh, when we start to see a lot of problems with, with fruit set on tomatoes. So uh, not only tomatoes, but uh, another problem on cucurbits, squash, pumpkins, cucumbers. Um, and I've got a squash that I planted very late in my yard. And it looks about like this. It's all male flowers right now, those slender stalks that you can see. Uh, and the males will tend to bloom first, tend to be produced first. And especially if it's high nitrogen, you've been putting on maybe a little 
too much compost or a little too much manure or other kinds of nitrogen sources, that will tend to flip the switch towards the male flowers instead of the female. And that's one of the reasons why we say be careful with fruiting plants that you don't put on too much nitrogen. The other thing that does it, yep, you got it. The heat will do that as well. So uh, we will look for those uh, female flowers to start. And the females, you can tell on cucurbits by that little miniature fruit at the base of it. So this is a female cucumber flower. This is a male squash flower. And pumpkin would look look similar. So, so the, the little miniature fruit at the bottom kind of looks a little bit like what the uh, fruit will eventually become. Now, you're not all lost if it's squash blossoms, uh, if you're only getting the males, because you can harvest them and uh, go ahead and fry them up for, for a tasty meal. Another question that I'm seeing a lot uh, on social media and so forth is why are my tomatoes not ripening? Well, it can take anywhere from six to 10 weeks from the time the, the flower first uh, blooms on the, on the stalk before uh, you get an actual ripe tomato. And that will do the six to 10 weeks depends both on the varieties and the size. If it, it's a cherry tomato versus, you know, one of the great big two pound mortgage lift, lifters uh, and as well as the temperature. And actually, you'd think at 100 degrees, it's growing very quickly. That's, that's not actually true. Uh, in the first two weeks after the flower is formed and is, is pollinated, uh, the tomato is busy creating little cells. And the number of cells that are formed in that two weeks in some ways will determine the, the end size of the tomato because after that first two weeks, they don't, they don't actually produce any more cells. It's just the cells getting larger for the next uh, four to 10 or four to six weeks. So you can have a tomato that's reached pretty much full size like this, and it can still take a month for the darn thing to ripen. So uh, be patient. Um, it will come eventually. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out on this uh, picture is this uh, shoulder coloring. And uh, this can happen in high temperatures. Actually, another thing when it gets really hot, the tomatoes won't turn red. They just kind of stay this orangey for a while. And once we get a little cooler, if it, or if it's nice and cool at night, uh, they'll go ahead and color up. But but you may see some of that damage yet around the around the stem end. And with that, uh, if we have some questions to take, let's take a look. Uh, looks like. John's going to have one for later on, but can squash vines be trimmed so they aren't so long and invasive? If you have all the squash fruit set that you want, uh, you can go ahead and trim them back. Uh, I would leave a few leaves above beyond the latest fruit uh, because those leaves will help feed that fruit as well. Does watering help ripening? Um, only if you didn't have enough water there to start with. <laughs> so uh, a lack of water uh, it will actually sometimes even if, it, if there's a little bit of stress, sometimes that will hasten the end process of ripening when it's, when it's getting to this breaker stage anyway. Uh, but uh, Otherwise, you know, a fruit needs water to expand and, and, and form flavor and, and all those good uh, things. Same goes for bell peppers as tomatoes for heat sensitivity. 
Yes, and probably even more so. Uh, bell peppers are notorious for not liking being stressed, whether that's from heat or if it dries out a little bit, or if you get a hot, dry wind, uh, they'll, they'll drop their, their flowers and even their tiny little fruit sometimes in response to stress. So bell peppers, you really want to, uh, you want to baby even more so. And they're in that same temperature range as tomatoes too. Again, we kind of think of hot peppers being in Mexico must, must be well adapted to heat and, and not as much. Um, and again, it can depend on variety. So some varieties are a little more uh, tolerant of, of heat than, than others. So uh, you can pay attention to that if you've had a lot of issues with it. Any other questions that I've missed? Rhoda, I saw a question cross our desk earlier today um, regarding Swiss chard and this gardener, they had Swiss chard that was bolting and they were wondering what they should do about it. Eat it quick. <laughs> uh, Swiss chard is a cool seasoned vegetable. Um, so that's one of those, I'd have to look up whether we could replant it at this stage. Uh, I haven't haven't looked at that. We're getting pretty uh, close to the end of of being able to plant most cool season crops. Although we can still do some like lettuce and and radishes and so forth. Uh, if you're planting any of those cool season crops now, you might want to create a shade for it uh, to help the keep the soil cooler, and that will help those. Uh, those plants get started. Many of our cool season crops uh, won't germinate above about 80 degrees. So if your soil's hot, they may suffer. If there's no more, I will turn it over to Christine and let her tell us about some of these beautiful plants that are having problems. <laughs> So yesterday I received a phone call from um, Southeastern South Dakota, and it was a garden center that had been receiving some inquiries about powdery mildew. Um, now this year for powdery mildew, we've had temperatures that are really hot and have been fairly dry. So it hasn't been incredibly favorable for disease progression. Powdery mildew is a fungus. It affects thousands of plants, but it's important to remember that powdery mildew that affects a lilac, for example, would not be the same species of powdery mildew that affects something like a monarda which, or bee balm, which is shown here. Um, so the pathogen is favored by humid conditions and those mild temperatures of 70 to 80 degrees. What's really interesting about powdery mildew is while it can be spread by splashing water, um, the spores actually will not germinate in free water. So if we had, you know, um, and this would be great, wouldn't it? If we had nice rainy conditions, we wouldn't expect to see as much powdery mildew. Um, but down in the Southeast South Dakota region, they were seeing some powdery mildew on Monarda and wondering what to do about it. So since this was a phone inquiry, I didn't have the photo to go with it, but the areas that are circled on the leaves um, show that white, that classic symptom of powdery mildew. It looks like white powder. This is seen on the top of the leaves and typically just the top. As the disease gets worse, you'll see that powder get, you know, thicker and it'll just look like it's completely covered in white. Those leaves might start to yellow and die back. Um, and something to be aware of, because I've had this question before with powdery mildew, sometimes people will mistake if you do a lot of overhead watering and you have, you know, calcium deposits or other mineral deposits from your water, you'll want to differentiate, you know, is this just from watering? Is this truly powdery mildew? Powdery mildew, typically it starts on lower leaves and it spreads up. Um, again, the spores can be transferred from rain splash. They can be carried over on debris that's left, you know, in the soil or over winter. So mulching can be helpful to prevent any spread of those spores back up the plant material. And, um, 
other controls, really ways to improve airflow and reduce humidity around those plants. So um, looking at some of the monarda around here, some of it is at its peak bloom and it still looks gorgeous. Some of it, the blooms are starting to decline and have already you know, provided a source of um, forage for our pollinators. So if that's the case, if you have Monarda that you're noticing powdery mildew and it's already bloomed, don't be afraid to deadhead those plants, cut that foliage back and improve airflow. And again, powdery mildew affects a wide variety of plants. It's you know not uncommon to see on garden flocks, for example, or zinnias. When it comes to our perennials, um, this is also a great opportunity if you have gardens that have mass plantings and really tight plant material without a lot of airflow, it might be time to consider dividing some of those perennials. There are fungicide um, fungicides that are available through our garden centers. But typically in a home garden setting, while it, while it doesn't look super great, um, fungicides would need to be very intentional with prevention versus um, being a, a cure-all. And so really my recommendation is to focus on spacing out those plants, living with a little bit of powdery mildew, and there are some resistant varieties for powdery mildew, especially if you look at some of the newer flocks that have been released. Um, and speaking of dividing perennials, let's talk about irises. So next slide, please, Rhoda. Thank you. As Dr. Ball indicated, the heat sped up a lot of things this summer. Our irises bloomed sooner. And um, when we think about dividing a, you know, spring, late spring, early summer blooming plant like irises, it's best to do that four to six weeks after they've bloomed. So we've hit that mark and are starting to surpass it. And with irises, um, it's not uncommon to have a nice overgrown full clump growing you know, in your yard. These photos are actually from my father's yard in Minnesota. And these irises had been growing for a long time and they're not, um, they're no longer blooming extensively. That's a good sign that it's time to rejuvenate this planting, dig that apart, get those plants spaced out. And irises spread through rhizomes, which are those horizontal underground stems that you can see um, both exposed in the photo on the lower left, as well as cut apart on the photo in the upper right. So with those irises, um, this is not necessarily for the faint of heart, especially if it is a very overgrown clump. Get in there with either a garden fork or a heavy duty shovel. And um, you can dig out that clump and start to break those rhizomes apart. You can either tease them apart by hand or some gardeners will set a clump, get all of that soil off of there and start to cut those rhizomes. You want you know, approximately two to three inches of that underground stem remaining, which is what I'm trying to show in the photo in the upper right. You'll notice that I have not only cut those rhizomes into pieces, I've identified the most recent shoot on each of those rhizomes. So that growing point where you see that fan of leaves, that's gonna be the direction that those irises continue to grow. And you'll see that I've cut the foliage back to about one third of what it was. And that way, when you replant those irises, there's gonna be less transplant shock and less water loss due to transpiration. And so once you have those rhizomes cut, you've identified where you're gonna put this new planting or you've dug out the clump and you've um, you know, amended that, especially if it's a planting that's been there for a long time and you're just putting a few rhizomes back in place. Don't be afraid to amend that soil with compost. Um, irises don't need a lot of fertilizer, but doing some compost, rejuvenating that soil, especially if it's very compact, isn't a bad idea. Um, if you're sharing these rhizomes with friends or moving them elsewhere, getting those replanted within a few days would be helpful or storing them in one or two gallon pots with media and keeping them watered, um, not letting them sit out for days on end, forgetting about them in your garage. They're not going to transplant well. Um, so that's a, an incredible opportunity to, to share some plants, make sure we're always looking for healthy plants that are disease free and don't have any signs of insect damage. And as we think about some of our other summer flowering perennials, we're going to wait a few more weeks until they start to decline in peak bloom production. And we'll revisit some other um, perennial plants that we can divide this fall. So with that, let's see if there's any questions on perennial plants. 
I do believe there's one on milkweeds, which maybe we can share between you and Amanda. That's uh, what I was just looking at. So the question is, as Amanda jumps on, my milkweeds have half inch, one inch black, orange, and white fuzzy craw crawlers. It has an upside down V shape to its back fur. The fur is about a quarter inch long. The milkweeds also have many black dots on the leaves. The leaves have an oily look to them. What is the crawler and why are the leaves oily and getting onto my flower leaves? So the fuzzy thing on the milkweeds is actually the milkweed tussock caterpillar. There are quite a few insects besides monarchs that utilize milkweed as part of their life cycle. And the milkweed tussock moth caterpillar is another caterpillar that you will find feeding on the milkweeds. Um, as for the leaves having an oily look, my guess is that there's a colony of aphids and that is actually sheen from the honeydew that is dropping onto the leaves. Um, the black, black dots could possibly be some sooty mold developing on that honeydew, especially if you know there hasn't been any rain to wash, um, wash that honeydew away. Um, with both of those issues though, uh, Milkweed, especially when it's flowering, is a great resource for pollinators and also for monarchs. So it's not a plant that we recommend people use any sort of insecticide on. Um, you know, if it, if it is aphids, if you look underneath leaves, and I will have some pictures here in a minute, um, I would say, you know, hitting it with some water to rinse some of that honeydew away and rinse some of those aphids off is really going to be all that you should be doing to manage. Awesome. Thank you, Amanda. So I had a clarifying question about should we be cutting back our irises if we're not um, transplanting or replanting them? That's a great question. Don't be afraid to cut that foliage back halfway down. It's probably browned back to that point by now anyways. So it started, that plant is starting to go dormant for the season. Um, by cutting it halfway down, you're preventing some possible fungal and bacterial issues. It looks a little more attractive in the garden, but I wouldn't do that until it's starting to dry back a bit. Um, I also have a question. Some someone bought some perennial bulbs this spring and they haven't planted them. Um, things including lilies and hostas. If it's things like tulips or lily bulbs, you could plant those out in the fall. If it's any of our more sensitive bulbs, such as um, cannas or gladiolus, those are going to be not over winter. So I would hang on to those at this point until the following season. And if you had any hosta crowns and those laid out and were completely dried, I'd be, um, I'd be a little concerned that those aren't um, going to be viable for you any longer. And I see we have one more question on perennials, but I'm gonna take a minute to think on the answer for that one and turn it over to our next guest. Oh, I'm like, am I next? I think I'm next. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know why that didn't go through, but there we are. All right, so uh, talking about starting off with aphids. So the milkweed question was a nice segue. Aphids are, I told the master gardeners that I saw last week at our in-person training. So that's why we weren't on garden hour last week. We were all driving around the state doing some continuing education for our new master gardener trainees. And the picture here on the left is actually from Macquarie Gardens. I was uh, going to get my car to pull it around and got distracted by a colony of uh, milkweed aphids. Uh, Aphis nerii is the species on some milkweed out um, by the parking lot. And you can see those aphids are a bright yellow color. So one thing that you'll notice with the aphids that are, or with the aphids, with the insects that are using milkweed um, as part of their life cycle is that they will often be brightly colored. And this is because they are sort of all using the milkweed's toxicity um, to their, um, you know, to their benefit. So just like monarch caterpillars are sequestering those cardiac glycosides so they don't taste good and they're advertising that fact by their bright colors, um, the milkweed aphids are kind of doing the same thing. They're also being tended by ants. And if you see ants crawling on your plant, um, that can be a really good indicator that you probably should be looking for aphids. 
Ants will actually tend aphid colonies. They'll harvest the honeydew, so the, the sugary secretions that come out of the back end of the aphid. That's what can give that sort of glossy appearance on, on the tops of leaves, especially if we're not getting rain uh, to wash it away. So that is a really nice little aphid colony. They do prefer the growing points of plants. So when you're scouting, that's often the place where you'll find them first. However, they will move to uh, some more mature, mature foliage. Um, and you can see the picture on the right here is a sunflower in my backyard. I was looking at it in my garden today and I was wondering about, you know, I had a lot of wasps that were visiting the leaves and I'm like, huh, I wonder what they're doing. And then I'm like, oh wait, I should probably flip this leaf over and see if I've got aphids anywhere. And sure enough, um, I've got a pretty healthy aphid colony hanging out on this large uh, sunflower plant. There are a lot of things out there that eat aphids. And so in my yard, you know, I'm not doing any sort of uh, special management for these insects, especially too, because they're on essentially, you know, ornamental plants, you know, they're not causing really, you know, any real damage for me. Um, but your ladybugs, your lacewigs, your surf lace wings, your surfed fly larvae, all of those things are predators on aphids. So a sort of balanced garden ecosystem is going to have some aphids present because they are sort of that bottom of the food chain for a lot of our predators. So you may, may want to scout around and see if you can find the aphids that are hanging out and you can, you know, observe some of the things eating them and some of the other insects that are using them. Uh, next slide, please. As for the insects that I'm still getting a lot of calls about, solitary wasps. <laughs> um, we've got, we still have cicada killers. So that is the image on the right. That was actually caught by some of the trainees at the Master Gardener class at Mercury Gardens last week. We did release it after we were done observing and taking pictures, but you can see that it is a very large wasp. Um, We've probably gone over this in previous garden hours, but I'm still getting questions. So I wanted to do sort of the reminder. These solitary wasps, they are ground nesters. They are not generally aggressive towards humans. They may sort of patrol an area, but they don't have a nest to defend like yellow jackets do um, or paper wasps. Um, so they're not gonna sort of mount a coordinated defense with all of their friends if you get too close to their home. Um, a lot of people ask me what they can do to kill these, and I would really encourage people to let them live. Um, if you want to get rid of them, you pretty much have to either catch or spray them directly, which honestly is a lot of effort for an insect that is just out there living its life. I know that they are big and scary looking, but truly they are far more interested in hunting for cicadas than they are for going after people. You can see my milkweed on the left. I have a stem that, or I have a couple plants that are actually blooming. Um, so I have kind of a second wave of milkweed blossoms, which I actually just had a monarch, a female monarch laying eggs on them um, in the yard this evening. So that second flush of milkweed flowers is still very attractive to the monarch butterflies, which is pretty cool. Um, but you can see there's a little, well, it's actually not so little, but a decently sized um, sort of metallic blue black wasp that was hanging out on that leaf on that flower uh, looking at me like, what the heck are you doing lady? Um, but this is another one of our solitary ground nesters. It's a spider wasp. Um, they do sort of the same thing as cicada killers. They just do it to spiders. Um, and that's another one that you might see kind of flitting around on sidewalks, you know, in areas hunting. Um, they might look terrifying, but again, they're much more interested in hunting than they are in people. Um, next slide, please. And uh, my final slide, uh, cool insect alert. I get pictures of caterpillars a lot. Um, and as we get later in the summer, the caterpillars get bigger and bigger. Um, people tend to sort of see these large caterpillars when they are looking for a place to pupate. So these caterpillars will sort of move off of their food source and be wandering around. And especially in yards and gardens, that's when people notice them. A lot of these really large caterpillars are in the hawk or the sphinx moth family. Um, and they tend to be, you know, they can have, you know, really distinct patterns. Um, and the horn on the end of the caterpillar is also um, very characteristic of this family. 
Um, and so this one is actually the Spurge hawk moth caterpillar. So as the name suggests, it does uh, consume uh, the spurges and leafy spurges in there as well. And so this uh, picture actually came to me from Game Fish and Parks. They saw it when they were out um, West River, I believe, or in Rapid City. Uh, these caterpillars, you know, by the time they're this big and you see them, they're not harming anything. They're looking for a place to pupate. Um, you know, tomato hornworms are in the same family. And once they get big and go to pupate, you know, the damage has been done. You're going to get a cool moth out of the deal. These are the moths that are, you know, very large, will tend to be active around dusk. And sometimes out of the corner of your eye, you will uh, mistake them for, you know, a small bird or a hummingbird. Um, so they're just a really cool insect. And it's always fun to get uh, caterpillar pictures because sometimes, you um, they can be a little bit of a challenge to identify, but not this one. He's got a very, very distinct pattern. Um, and I see we've got a question in the chat um, asking, do ants kill monarch caterpillars or harm the chrysalis? So monarch caterpillars um, have natural enemies out there in the wild. There are diseases and things that, you know, make it harder for them to survive. Um, and that's just sort of part of nature. Um, so ants, are omnivores. They're fairly generalist. Uh, they will collect, you know, plant seeds. They will collect other insect eggs and eat them. Um, however, once monarch caterpillars get to be a fairly decent size, um, you know, they're, they're going to be too big for an ant to do anything to. You know, but there are, you know, there is some predation of monarch eggs and caterpillars when they're very small. Um, as for the chrysalis, so monarchs will tend to move off of the milkweed and go uh, form their chrysalis somewhere else. Um, you know, and it's they're in that chrysalis stage for a fair amount of time. Um, you know, something could try to chew on it, but most of the times, you know, they're sort of like fairly well camouflaged in that chrysalis stage. And at that point, if something goes wrong, you know, we're usually looking at a pathogen as being the culprit. All this to say, I know that people love monarch butterflies. I love them. Like I rear them in my house. I usually get like two to four every year from eggs that are laid in my backyard. Um, but like, don't think that you need to manage other insects in order to make monarch butterflies more successful. I really don't want people to be, you know, spraying insecticide on their milkweed because of say like the tussock moth caterpillars or because they see ants or aphids. That's gonna do more harm to potential monarch caterpillars and sort of the ecosystem than letting that food chain, um, you know, do its thing. Um, so yeah, so please don't, please don't manage insects on, uh, on milkweed. <laughs> Uh, looks like we've got a question about how to prevent hornworms without using pesticides. So you can't really prevent them, but what you can do is you can go out in your backyard at night with a black light and you can black light for the caterpillars. They will sort of like glow on the plants and then you can very easily hand pick them off. So that's actually what I would recommend if you are looking to sort of get ahead of um, hornworm caterpillars in your tomatoes next year. If you've got some right now, like, you know, go pick up a black light and, you know, do some experimenting and, uh, you know, sort of get comfortable with the process. But that's what I would say to do. And if you have chickens, I hear that chickens love eating the caterpillars once you pick them off the plants. So that's another option for sort of reintroducing them into the food chain. Otherwise, you can just squish them or, you know, drown them in some soapy water. So I think I've uh, hit all the insect questions. So back to you, Rhoda. Thanks, Amanda. And uh, we may have some more questions coming in and feel free to keep typing in your questions. Uh, that's what we're here for. And then I will turn it over to John and we will get John's slides up here. Hey, there we go. All right, well, hey, thanks, Rhoda, and thank you, uh, Amanda, for your interesting bug talk. Hey, before I get started in EAB, I do have an Amanda bug question. So, uh, Amanda, if you're still there. Still here. All right, <laughs> I got a question for you. When I was a kid, 
so this is back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. I can remember driving in cars uh, and literally almost swarms of monarch butterflies and other butterflies. I, I mean, literally, I can remember seeing them. Uh, and, you know, obviously the cars are going through them left and right. And to be quite honest, I've not seen those sort of swarms in 20 years. And so the question I have for you is kind of a huh question as I drive across the state. Have vehicles had any impact on migrating butterflies? <laughs> so first of all, when you said, you know, when you're a kid and dinosaurs roamed the earth and you're talking about cars, I was really surprised that it wasn't like the horse and buggy days, but. You haven't seen the Flintstones. It was the yabby yeah. yabba do car. We just flipped our, uh, our legs around. <laughs> so, you know, even while I've been in South Dakota, we have had some plague levels of butterflies. They haven't been monarch butterflies, but I want to say it was like five or six years ago, we had a ton of painted lady butterflies that were coming out of the soybeans. And so, you know, that was a lot of people were confusing those with monarchs. Monarchs will mass up in the fall when they're heading back down to Mexico. So that is one time of year where, where we do still see sort of those large groups of butterflies. And those tend to go more down that I-29 or Jim River corridor versus, you know, out here in Pier. Um, but it's not that cars have been having a big impact on um, insect populations, but there there have been sort of these documented overall declines in arthropod and insect biodiversity and just numbers over the years. And I really think habitat loss is what's to blame on a lot of those changes in our farming practices, changes in our land land management practices. You know, we used to have a lot more weeds in fields, and those were milkweed, and those were the food source for the monarch caterpillars. So you know, it used to be that you could have a corner a soybean field that was a nursery for things like monarch butterflies and now you know their habitat has been so greatly reduced that you know the numbers that we're seeing overwintering in Mexico are you know hovering down at almost endangered species levels. Oh okay all right well it's good to know cars haven't been a problem yeah. but <laughs> in, in, you know what I, I'll agree with you on the uh, on the habitat I mean we took six acres that had always been used by uh, uh, for cows and that sort of been grazed continuously. And we fenced it off. It was kind of in a little slough area. And in two years, I was amazed at the forbs and flower, you know, mm -hmm. perennials and that that came back onto that that land. And a lot of a lot of milkweed, but a lot of other plants too. And we did end up with a lot of butterflies too. So it was pretty cool. And some yeah. pheasants too for everybody that's interested. All right. Well, anyway, uh, off pheasants for a bit and on to Emerald Ash Borer. Uh, Emerald Ash Borer needs no introduction. I'm certain everybody watching this is all too familiar with this insect. However, interesting enough, I will run across people that say, oh, didn't that already go through the state? Uh, hasn't already gone through Sioux Falls even. Nope, it's really just getting started. And it's going to be a continual problem for, you know, a couple of decades, and then we'll be out of ash trees by then. Uh, but one of the things I do like to do is let everyone know where we are in the development of the insect. And obviously, this is pertinent if you're in Minnehaha or Lincoln County. If you're not in those two counties, then we certainly aren't asking you to begin treating your ash trees. That would be way premature. Uh, you want to wait until we've identified it with at least within your county or within 15 miles of your location. And so far, we've not had any fines outside of those two counties, despite the fact every week I am chasing down uh, some really good suspects. I mean, you get out there and it almost looks like it, but it's not. But on the trees that are infested, I do cut them up and to take a look at how the insect is developing. And they're developing very quickly this year. We are a little ahead in, in growing degree days. Um, in fact, a little ahead of last year and quite a bit ahead of 2014, uh, by the way, which was the year that we actually had measurable snow 
the second week of September in Rapid City, for those that might remember that. So for those uh, enduring the heat, you might have be making snowballs a month from now. So enjoy it while it lasts. But what you can see here is what we call a second instar. Uh, the larvae goes through a series of developments, uh, getting a little bigger each time. And the second instar is somewhere in a quarter to a half an inch long. Now, for all you budding entomologists and Amanda, obviously we measure the head capsule size to determine the instar, not the length of the body. So it's kind of like uh, for people, if we measured your head and said, ah, you got a pretty wide head, you must be an adult. Uh, but on these, the important thing here to remember is look how little that is, just a little cutie. And it's barely etching the phloem tissue on there, meaning it's not doing a lot of damage to the tree yet. Now, in a couple of weeks, when we're at the third end of the star, those things are get to be huge, uh, more than an inch long, and they are not threading their way through the phloem tissue. They are plowing their way through the phloem tissue, the tissue that carries the sugars, and they're so big and wide they actually, actually etch the sapwood, which is where the water's moved. So it's the third instars that actually start really doing the damage to the tree. Uh, the point of all this is if you live in Minnehaha or Lincoln County and you have an ash tree that you like, uh, hopefully you've already had it treated because undoubtedly there's emerald ash for somewhere near where you live. It might even be in a tree near you, your tree in fact. And if you treat the trees in the spring, that insecticide is very quickly taken up into them. It will kill mom as she's feeding on leaves before she lays eggs. And if one happens to fly in and lay eggs on your trees without munching on the leaves, it's going to kill the larvae while they're first and second instar. And that means you're going to kill the larvae before they're big enough to start damaging the tree. Um, yes, you can inject them at this time of year, and there's companies that are out there doing it, uh, but it's not as good a control because it's going to take a while for the chemical to go up, and by that time, you're third in star. So I really strongly recommend that if you have an ash tree you want to keep, and hopefully there's ash trees out there people do want to keep, uh, that the treatments be done really in May after it leaves out in kind of May and early June time period. Uh, and the reason for that is chemical will be taken up into the leaves, kill mom while she has to eat a little bit before she starts laying eggs. And then uh, again, anybody that happens to lay eggs on the tree without eating on that leaves on that particular tree, you'll kill the larvae while they're very tiny. And stay tuned in a couple of weeks, I'll show you what uh, the big brother or sister of this one looks like. And it's not pretty. And by the way, um, they're going to quit feeding in October. So this, they're going to eat for about another, what, six weeks or so. And then they're, they're ready for winter. So people that treat their trees in October, for example, are just doing it for fun. Uh, it's really not having the major impact. So the next slide, please, as we used to say with slide projectors. Well, that wasn't quite the next one, but we'll go with it. Um, hopefully there's another one in there. Is there, is there a third one in there, Rhoda? Hey, there we go. Let's do that one next. Not that one. There you go. Fall Weber. Uh, fall Weber. It's fall already, people. Uh, look at these little insects. They, again, are a little ahead of schedule, though we typically see these in August. Uh, they're kind of, they're, they're web worms. They're kind of like tent caterpillars. But tent caterpillars appear in the spring. And they have their nests form in the branch unions inside the tree. So they're kind of in the center of it, where the web worms form their webs right at the tips of the branches. The other interesting thing is 10 caterpillars make their tent in the spring, and then they leave the tent and kind of wander around feeding on leaves, come back to the tent for a while and kind of leave again and go feed and come back a little, uh, a little bit later kind of like kids that just don't leave the nest, come back and live in the basement. Uh, that's kind of like the tent caterpillars. Web worms operate a little differently. They keep making the web bigger and they just live in the web. And you see that 
web nest there. In a couple of weeks, you're going to see whole tree canopies that look like cotton candy because the webs can literally cover a large proportion of a tree. Right now, they're small. You'll see them in a couple of branches. Uh, but they're, the nests are just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger as the insects get bigger and bigger and bigger and need to feed on more leaves. But they essentially keep building this nest around them. Uh, and that's why you're not going to find them out by themselves. They're always kind of feeding with a group there. They're just kind of like stay together uh, and will wander back and forth feeding on uh, cottonwoods they like, elms they like, maples they like, uh, cherries they like, walnuts they like. Uh, if you walk slowly, they might like you. Uh, they seem to feed on just about any any tree, but uh, the ones I mentioned are probably their preferred hosts. And by the way, there are certain trees they seem to like, and they tend to reappear on them. Uh, but uh, you know, the question always is, well, what do I do? Well, don't burn the webbing. I get people every year that figure gasoline in a match sounds like a good control measure. And it is if you didn't like the tree because uh, you're gonna torch that thing. It's gonna look like fire blight. And I've seen a couple of uh, crab apple trees uh, that were completely scorched by that. And so, you know, leave the gasoline for your vehicles, not for your trees. A real simple task, and one that Amanda would appreciate is if you take a long two by two and stick it in these webs while they're small, put a nail through it and stick it in it and twist it, kind of like you're making cotton candy, you're going to tear that nest all apart. And the value to that is if you ever look at these nests, there's all these other little insects that are buzzing around trying to figure out how to get into that nest. All right, kind of like the big bad wolf and the and the three little pigs in their house. Well, think of these three little pigs, all those little tent cat or those little web worms uh, and those wolves, everything that eats these kind of outside. And if you tear the nest open, they can get in and, and get them. The other thing too, is it, it puts them out in the cold and the heat and everything else, and they don't do as well. So just tearing the nest is actually a fairly good means of managing them. Um, other than that, you know what, spraying doesn't work as well with these because most of the time your spray isn't going to get in that webbing either, unless you do a, a lot of pressure to it. Um, you can inject chemicals into the tree to kill them. You can inject chemicals in the soil to kill them. But Amanda's probably cringing at some of that just because of the non-target organisms. And uh, I would agree with her that really this is feeding at the end of the season. And I'm not going to say the leaves are not important at that point. They actually are. But the tree can survive this. And so really look at it as just kind of uh, nature's way of getting rid of, you're going to have to rake fewer leaves. How's that? That's just nature's way of helping you. And I, and I really wouldn't put a lot of emphasis on going out and trying to tree, particularly after you start seeing large nests out there. All right, now that other slide, whichever order it was in. There, there we go. This was an interesting stop I had this last week on a day where it was 109 degrees uh, up in, uh, well, north of Pier, we'll leave it at that. And it was it's a uh, blue spruce, Colorado blue spruce windbreak. And what you'll notice there is one tree looks a lot shorter than the others. And they were asking because these trees were popping up in the long windbreak. And the windbreak's about 20 years old, now 15 years old or so. So that should be giving you a clue too. And I don't have a slide of it just because I didn't want to load too many in here. But when I got underneath that tree and carefully, because there's snakes out there, uh, carefully pulled away some of the sod that was developing around the base of these trees, I pulled the fabric. because And the fabric looked as good as the day it went in. And on that tree that stunted, the fabric was embedded in the trunk. You know, one of the issues we have is that fabric is important, it's critical, but on conifers where that ground is shaded and starts filling in with soil, you can end up with a problem somewhere between age 10 and 20 where the fabric can end up girdling some of the trees, not all of them, because the slit wasn't made wide enough 
in that and sunlight is not getting down there so it doesn't begin to degrade like it does underneath deciduous trees. And what I really recommend is at about year five or six, you get underneath these and tear out all the fabric. You don't need it anymore. It's done its job. It provided that uh, protection for the seedlings while they get started. These trees do not need fabric anymore. They are winning any race. And I really like to see the, that work done between year five and 10. Uh, don't wait till it's too late that we even hear I recommended to try it, but between year five and 10 is really what you want to look for. And, and again, if you're ever out there looking at shelter belts that are about 15, 20 years old, and you see these occasional trees that quote, suddenly die, but they appeared a little stunted compared to the neighbors. Look around the base and find that fabric. And if you can't pull it out from the trunk of the tree, it's probably embedded into it. Uh, we'll keep the slide on, but I did have a question. And the question was, someone found in a cottonwood that had a root about two inches that was somewhat circling the trunk. What should they do? Cut the root off. Uh, because what will happen, that will become a stem girdling root. As that root gets larger and is pressed into the trunk, it'll end up girdling the trunk and kill the tree. Uh, it'll stun it for five or 10 years and finally the tree will die. Usually we do not see stem girdling roots if the tree was not planted. Well, if the tree was planted at the right depth, we will not see them. If it's planted a little too deep, so part of that stem is in the ground, that's where you're gonna find stem girdling roots. So the first way to avoid that problem is plant at the proper depth. The second way to avoid that problem is try to pull out the roots if it was a container tree before you plant it. Uh, but now, yes, the one root, cut it off. However, I would wait until fall to do that. Right now, every tree in the state is water stressed and the loss of one root could make a, uh, an impact to it. So let's wait on that until fall, but absolutely. Oh, and what do I think of the plastic gator bags hanging around trunks, trees to provide water? You bet. It's a great way to provide water as long as you fill the bag. Uh, and I'm surprised at how often that isn't done. Uh, but keep if you keep them in, that's fine. If you want the if, if you want, go out and get a runnings five gallon tub, poke a nail hole in the bottom and sit that next to the tree, too, because that'll slowly get the water in. Uh, if you don't want to go out and buy the gator bags, but the gator bags work. And then I see IPS beetles. Yep. Those are kind of like the UPS beetles, all right? No, it's Ips beetles. Uh, can they be spread by cutting down dead trees or should I wait till uh, September, October? Yeah, wait another month to start cutting trees down uh, because the beetles are still flying. But at that point, cutting down, destroying the trees will help reduce the infestation. And by the way, the rains that we're starting to get, that's helping to reduce the problem too because Ips can only attack standing trees if they're stressed. and the rains are helping to kind of reduce that a little bit. So let's hope we have some more. Uh, two small linden trees, one has yellow leaves, which are dropping. Uh, I've already had the local arborist cut two portions of it out already. Yeah. Uh, no, um, leaves that are dropping. You know what I, I see on lindens right now that are causing that are aphids. What Amanda was talking about earlier. Uh, you might want to look for aphids or there's a scale, uh, an insect that is immobile. And it's the cottony maple scale that apparently doesn't understand it's on a linden tree. But it'll look like little corn pops. But I've seen at this time of year, and, and I'm seeing it this year, if you're getting some yellow leaves, which are dropping, I'll bet you're looking at some aphids. So try that first. With that, I think I've monopolized a lot of time, but hey, trees are important. So I'll turn it back to you, Rhoda. All right. And we had a question that, Christine, uh, did you want to come back to a question about Cupid start? What is yeah. that? Um, so it's a, a beautiful blue perennial. It's got the, um, you know, just radiating petals, flowers on single stalks. I'm not as familiar with it. And I've been trying to think about a good way to describe, you know, thinking about new buds versus spent blooms on sunflowers can be kind of difficult. 
So um, a good rule of thumb is when you think about forming buds, you should be able to start see, you know, they should be tight and firm and it should feel, you know, somewhat pliable and squishy. You might start to see petals forming. Some new forming buds will look somewhat scaly, if you will, versus a lot of times with our spent blooms, all you're going to see remaining, and I'm, I'm using my hand to illustrate this because I don't have a photo, um, you'll see typically that those petals will have dropped out of the calyx and you'll just have that green, it will look like a green empty bell and that will start to dry down and oftentimes that will drop off as well. Um, so that's kind of a, a really quick way to think about buds versus spent blooms. So, you know, plump and squishy and firm to the touch versus, you know, an empty bell where those petals are starting to drop out and that should start to feel crispy. And again, that's not um, maybe the best descriptor, but we'll work on having some photos next time I'm on. <laughs> or if the person who, who uh, put in the question can take some photos and send to us, uh, we, can, we can work with that too. Even better. <laughs> You're always welcome to send us uh, photos. Uh, you can do it through email. And let me go back to the PowerPoint. You can contact the SDSU Extension Garden Hotline. Uh, you can you see the email addresses there as well as phones. So uh, sometimes when you want to send a, a picture, it's easiest to do that through email. And so you can attach photos to the emails, or you can call if you need to talk with a live person and sort of talk through a, an issue. And, and sometimes when we do that, we turn around and say, well, can you send a photo of that? Um, but then we already have the context for it so that that works well. Uh, you're also welcome to contact, uh, contact us through the extension sdstate.edu garden slash yard. Uh, and when you go to that page, uh, you'll see a, a problems and solutions tab on the drop down menu. And this contact information here is on that page, as well as at the bottom, uh, there's an ask extension uh, form that comes up and you can type in your questions and that gets to us as well. So lots of different options for getting your questions uh, questions answered. And uh, of course, you're always welcome to come back next week and uh, ask us on Garden Hour. With that, I want to thank the panelists tonight. We have uh, Christine. And I'm trying to stop share here and it doesn't want to stop sharing there. Christine, thank you uh, for being on tonight. Amanda, for sharing all your knowledge with the, the little things that make us curious or make us step away. <laughs> and with John Ball. Thank you all uh, for for attending tonight and know that you can also go to our website and listen to episodes you might have missed or if you missed something tonight and you want to go back and look at it uh, you're welcome to do that with that thank you and have a good week